Amen. Thank you, Brother Darren. Thank you guys for leading this morning. Thank you, Bible. Turn to Ezra chapter 3 as we continue through this book of regathering, rebuilding, and revival. I want us to look at chapter 3 this morning, the first six ver- verses. And in the day and age which we live where the debate is whether or not we ought to have an invitation and call people to an altar, I believe this is a word um, that we need to really pay attention to. I know there's different strokes for different folks, but I just believe that before you can worship, you've got to spend time at an altar. Before there can be a celebration, there must be a construction of an altar. And so as we walk through these verses today, I want you to understand first thing's got to come first. And so if in your private life, there hadn't been much talking and fellowship with the Lord throughout the week, I doubt there's very going to be very much go on in your life inside of a worship center and a sanctuary when you get together corporately. But in the 1990s, Steve Milliken and Ray Boltz wrote a song called The Altar. And the second stanza goes like this. A father is praying with his son. A mother kneels beside them thanking God they've come. An old man is standing there in tears, giving up a part of him that he's held back for years. Hearts are being broken. Lives are being changed. And those who call upon him, they will never be the same. The time has come to give in to the Lord. That's what this altar is for. That's what this altar is for. You don't have to carry those burdens anymore. There's a light in the darkness. There's a love that's true. And Jesus is waiting. He's waiting here for you. In the Old Testament, God told Israel that it's at the altar where there would be burnt offerings and sacrifices. It would be at that place where God would meet man. Inside the Holy of Holies, as the blood of the sacrifice of the lamb or the bull was taken behind the veil and put on the mercy seat, where Shekinah glory would come and consume the blood and give approval of now a relationship that had been restored and put right and now fellowship has become equal back to where God would have it to be between a holy God and sinful man. So today, as we find that these folks have now made a 900-mile journey, these Israelites that were given the word to go and go home and 50,000 of 2.5 million came to a place of desolation. I shared with you guys three weeks ago, most folks want Jesus to take them to a level where they get more. Not many people go where there's nothing. In other words, God called these folks, he stirred in their hearts to go back to Jerusalem that was in pure desolation. They had no homes, they had no city, they had no economy, they had absolutely nothing, and yet God called them from the pots of Babylon, from the comforts of where they were at, for many of them, that, that's the only thing they knew. For 70 years, they had lived in Babylon, and God called them to go to nothing. That is right the opposite of what we hear in America today. Many people believe that this is the same journey that Abraham would have taken as he made his way to Mount Moriah where the first sacrifice would have been made between him and Isaac and the ram caught in the thicket. Because today, if you go to the, uh, the Holy Mount where the Muslim mosque is sitting, the exact location of where the Holy of Holies was designed to sit, the exact location where the mercy seat set is the exact location where Abraham offered Isaac. And so as you understand how Old Testament moves to New Testament, all the Christophany and the pictures uh, and, the, and the typology of who Jesus is to the Jew and the Jew not get it, I think sometimes we miss it. This is a four-month journey. Did you hear me? I don't know how many of you guys have ever taken four months to get to church. Most folks will quit if it's over 40 minutes. But here's the, here's the truth of it. In chapter 7, verse 9, you'll find that when Ezra comes with the second bunch of folks, it takes them four months. I want us to read that. Ezra chapter 7, verse 9, look at what it says. It says, 
So you guys get it. On the first day of the first, first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. So if Ezra led less folks in four months, we know that under all indications, it would have taken these folks four months to get to where they're at. So now, after four months of travel, they get into the city of Jerusalem, and now we're in the seventh month. So there's about three months for them to prepare and to make their homes and get everything together so that they could have their families taken care of, and they get the first things first, and that is get a place of regathering at the altar. So I want you to stand back up. I want us to read these verses again now that you understand what's going on. And let's see what God would have us to understand in 2020 of what we need to understand about the importance of a gathering place at the altar. Here's what it says. And when the seventh month had come, the children of Israel were in the cities that already established themselves. Remember the last verse of chapter 2 says, And everyone went to their own cities. The people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Yeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening burnt offerings. They also kept the Feast of Tabernacles as, as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings in the number required by ordinance for each day. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offerings and those for, the, for new moons and for all the appointed feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and those of everyone, those of everyone who were willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. This is the word of God. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. See, most of us in this room, what we would do is build the building first. When we got to the place of desolation and we wanted to gather together and worship, most of us in this room would have said, hey, we got to get a building first, not these folks. They understood the importance of, of building the altar first. In other words, they built the building around the altar. They didn't put the altar in the building. So I want to ask you a question. How important is your altar? Not only here, but in your own personal daily quiet time, in your own daily walk with the Lord. How important is the place that you meet the Lord? I want us to walk through two things, a lot of subpoints, so you got to say amen so we can hurry up and get out of here. Today at 5 o'clock, we'll be doing Sunday school. So for those of you that hadn't had it at 8 o'clock, we'll be doing Sunday school in person for the first time. Brother Kyle will give you some information about that at the end. Amen. I'm looking forward to it. I'm tired of Zoom. Amen. When I was in school, Zoom was a program on Channel 8 after the electric company come on. Anybody remember that? You got to Zoom, my Zoom, my Zoom. Okay, good. Uh that has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm saying. Anyway, so let's look at the first point. The first point is, as they regather together, the most important thing to these people, after being in bondage for 70 years, and now it's been at least 80 years since there has been a Passover or anything celebrated, they seize the moment, and it's a high watermark because the Bible says from that point on, they begin to continue doing the, the sacrificing. So let's look at it. First of all, I want us to look at the construction or the constructing of the foundation of the relationship. If God had told Israel that's where he met them, and yet the temple is a holy place, and the temple is the place where they needed to go and the place that they needed to, to simply consecrate themselves and get to, the number one thing that they were looking for was a place to have burnt offerings, a place to confess sin, a place to where they could be uh, sacrificing and slaying animals so that their sins could be atoned for. The altar is where the Jews' relationships was repaired and restored. It was vital to repair the fellowship and atone for their sins before, listen, before they could begin corporate worship. What's right the opposite of the day and age which we live. All we want to do is get people together. 
We want to have conferences. We want to have men's conferences and women's conferences, and we're going to get everybody together, and we get everybody together in a room, and everybody sings, and everybody gets a, gets a word, and everybody amens and shouts, and they go home, and they're unchanged. They're no different than they were the day they, the, than before they walked in because they have not spent some time alone before they come to corporate. Now listen, it's been going on for quite some time. As I've been sharing with you guys, we've had a spiritual autonomous zone like they've had in Seattle for probably 30 years because we have attitudes in the church. Preacher, don't tell me what i got to do. Don't call me to holiness. Don't tell me that I can't do this. What, what I do in my life is my business. It's nobody else's business. Well, I hate to tell you, but that is not what the Word of God says. And if you and I do not understand what God's called us to be, not to do, then, you would under, then we don't understand that our fellowship must be restored at a place where God meets us. Brother Kyle just said, as Brother Darren was singing, uh, the cross is where I was saved. There's a lot of folks can't say that. They don't have a place. So let's talk about this. I'll give you three important truths about the constructing of the altar in verses 1 and 2. First of all, they understood the significance of the month. Look at verse number 1. And when the seventh month had come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem for the first time in 80 years. In Tishri, in the month of September, October, the Jews' most celebrated month. Now, I want you to understand, Pentecost was the most celebrated festival, but the month of September, October is the most celebrated month. It was on that month that they understood that it was time for them to get together as one nation, as one people, to gather together, and they come for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that was to build the altar. So let's look at it real quick. They understood the significance of the month. The seventh month is the most sacred month for the Jew because there's multiple celebrations in that month, and we'll look at that in just a few moments. There's not just one, but there's multiples. Not only did they understand the significance of the month, number two, they unified solely as one man. This is the same thing that the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 when the church in the New Testament came together and had all things in common. Even though there was 50,000 people spread out in all these different locations, they came back from their cities to one city to come together for one purpose, and that was to exalt the Lord and not just simply rebuild the, rebuild the temple or rebuild the altar, but get together so that they can begin the sacrificial system and begin to atone for their sin that they have been committing over the last 80 years. The truth of the matter is they were where they were because God had called them to repent. They wouldn't repent, so God sent the Babylonians in. It very well could be, I want you to hear me, it very well could be that the COVID are you listening? It's because the church has been called to repentance for the last 25 years, and we won't do it. I've stood before you and told you for the last 17 weeks that God is stripping us of what we've been relying on. We've been relying on youth programs and choirs and praise teams and getting together and all the stuff, and God is stripping us from all the things that we're leaning on other than him. And then when we, get, when we do have an opportunity to get back together, we don't seize the moment. We don't look at each other and go, hey, I, I'm glad I got to see you today. If there's one thing we should have learned this past week is you better look around you and love on folks while you can. They came together as one man. They had all things in common. Nobody was there for their own benefit. Nobody was there to see what they could get out of it. Everybody came to see what they could give. Amen. Boy, we live in a day and age now where we have to get something out of it. I got to go hear what the preacher's got to say for me. I got to go get a word from God. Let me help you. If you don't have an altar and you don't have a place by yourself in private, then you're probably not going to get a word in here. And we live in a very critical spirit world where most folks come and they don't want to hear the word of God. They want to see how long a preacher preaches, how he dresses, whether he's inspirational or not. They don't want to come and hear from God. Are oh, you hearing me? People go, well, I don't, I don't know that we're in that bad of shape. Really? We'll just look and see how, what's going on. Here's, what it, here, here's the, the statistic from the Vatican of Lifeway. Y'all ready? Some of y'all catch that later. 
only 43% of people will return back to church. Because they'd rather sit at home in their pajama britches and watch it on TV. You say, well, Brother Brad, what, what, what's wrong with it? I'm telling you what's wrong with it. It violates Scripture. And, and, and what we're doing is, is we're allowing people and we're planting churches that totally go against the Word of God. And we're calling it church. One of the most amazing things is just go on the other side of the world and see what those people think about what's going on in America when it comes to church. So they came together as one man. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 tells us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some do as we see the day approaching. What does that mean? We ought to be getting together more, not less. Did you hear what I just said? Not only did they unify solely as one man, not only did they understand the significance of the month, they undertook the scriptural mandate. Oh, you got to see this. Because we live in a day and age now where people say it doesn't matter where you go to church. They say it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter here. It doesn't matter there. Don't preach doctrine. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. It doesn't really matter. Well, let me just tell you, it does matter. Look at verse number two. Here's what it says. Then Yeshua, the son of Josedach, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel. That's a comma. That's not a period. How? As it is written in the law of God, or the law of Moses, the man of God. They didn't just go and say, hey, we're going to build it how we want to build it. They didn't say, hey, we're going to do whatever we want to do. They didn't, they didn't come with an attitude, God, we know you want an altar, so we're going to build it, and you've got to take it. We're going to do it however we want to do it because, you know, we were limited in our resources because, you know, we've been in captivity for 70 years, and you know that, you know, it really doesn't matter what kind of altar it is as long as we've got an altar. No, 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 no. They had to build it the way the Scripture said. See, you must worship the way the Scripture says. You must live the way Scripture says. We must pray the way Scripture says. We must study the Bible the way Scripture says. Are you listening? Everything must be according to Scripture. So let's look at it. Let's look at what it says. Are y'all all right? Y'all worried about the weather? Y'all okay? Did you get some sleep? Y'all all right? Say something. Some of y'all need to check your pulse, I, I believe. As it is written. That's right. Tell them, Lord. Tell them, Lord. Tell them. Tell them. Tell them. Tell them. Let me give you four things, four truths about according to the Scripture. I want you to see it. First of all, it's in verse 3. They had to put it on the Lord's place. Here's what it says in verse 3. And they placed the altar, they set the altar on its bases. Now, what that means is it doesn't mean that they built a base and they set the altar on the base. No, they found the exact location that the old altar was on because God had told Moses that is the place that I'm going to meet you. They didn't get close. They didn't get in the nearby vicinity of it. They had to get it exactly where God said they would meet. Boy, that's a total different deal than what we live in today, isn't it? We have just fly-by, drive-by, drive-through church services. You go, Brother Brad, something's better than nothing. No, it isn't. There's only one way. Did you hear me? See, we also believe that two paydays are better than one. That's not marriage either. Can I get a witness in this house? See, our philosophy really shows what kind of theology we have. They had to put it on its basis. So you know what they had to do? They had to go get the blueprint that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. And they had to sit down with the scroll. And they had to get the dimensions. And they had to get the place. And they had to go to work. They had to... Clean it all first. Do you understand? There's rubble everywhere. So there had to be a cleanup crew. They just didn't go in and call Home Depot and let them drop some supplies there. They had to go in and there had to be a cleansing. There had to be a time of repenting. There had to, had to be a time, as my granddaddy would say, a garbage hauling revival. That you hauled garbage out of your stinking life. Stop stinking thinking. See, we want revival, but we won't, don't, we won't revival with God not messing with us. They found the Lord's place. I want you to look at Ezekiel 2, verse 68. 
Don't you see what it says? We didn't, we've already went through this. But Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 68. Here's what, as we close all that list of folks. It says, some of the heads of the father's house, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, offered, free will, offered freely for the house of God, watch this, to erect it in its place. There was a specific place. Do you understand? You don't just go, God, I'll meet you wherever I want to meet you. You don't say, God, I'll meet you on the creek bank. I know God's omnipresent. I know God's omniscient. I know God can meet wherever he wants to meet. But God has designed the local New Testament church for people to gather together to get under the reading and the preaching of the word of God to exalt the Lord Jesus to do a work in the lives of individuals. Can God do a work on the outside of this church? You doggone right he can. But you better find a place and an altar to be able to find a, a time and a place for him to meet you because if you don't do that, I promise you, your mind's going to be worried about the brass lantern and what you're going to do this week or what I'm saying and if I'm using the right verbs or not. And you're going to walk out of this room not having an encounter with the, the God of the Word and the Word of God. Had to go to the place. Not only did they do it according to the place. Number two, they did it according to God's purpose. Look at verse 2. Ezra chapter 3. Then Yeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel, watch this, to offer burnt offerings on it. They didn't just build the altar because it was an article that needed to be inside the church. They had a purpose. What was the purpose? They understood their desperate need of coming before the Lord God Almighty, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah, God Almighty, they, had to, they understood for them to approach God in corporate worship or even personal worship, there had to be a sacrifice offered. So they had to get first things first. I'm going to tell you, man, in 2020, you know what we'd do first? We're going to make sure the sound's right and the music's and the guitar's in tune, and we're going to make sure all the lights are working good because the first 15 minutes is the most crucial time. So when people come in, you make your first impression. Amen. Here's what I know. Have a prayer meeting with teenagers. Maybe four show up. You have a concert, 4,000 will show up. Because our mentality is we can come corporately and publicly without coming privately. Not only did they do it according to to the Lord's place and according to his purpose. What did they do it? They had to do it, listen, not just one time. They didn't build the altar just say, you know what, we're going to slay an animal and, we, you know, it's, God's just going to take it and we're just going to do No, they did morning and evening. They went right back to what God had commanded. See, you and I would have went, well, that's good enough. I mean, we built an altar. We, you know, we're in the midst of desolation. We don't have much to offer. We've been... Traveling for four months, been living here three months, and now here we are seven months into this thing. And, you know, uh, surely the Lord would be gracious. Surely the Lord is not going to require us to do everything exactly like how he said it. Yes, he did. Both morning and evening offerings. Boy, wouldn't it have been easy just to do one of them? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it have been easy just to do morning? Or wouldn't it have been easy to do evening for you late risers? Are we all right in this room? Wouldn't it have been a whole lot simpler just to pick one and do it, do one? No, no, no. That's not what it said. They did morning and evening. Now, here's what's going to bless your heart when we get down here further. What they did bring, all the animals they did bring, they wind up slaughtering because it's required of God. Not only... Did they do it according to the Lord's place and the Lord's purpose? Don't you see number three? They did it according to the Lord's plan. They had to build it exactly what God said. They had to build it by the correct dimensions. They had to do and carry out and replace exactly what God told Moses to begin with. You find that in Exodus chapter 27. Exodus 27, 1 through 8. I want us to look at that right quick. Right quick. They had to do it by the correct size, and they had to use the correct substance. They had to use the right material. 
You shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horn on its four corners. Its horn shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. Also, you shall make its, pan, its pans to receive its ashes and its shovels and its basins and its forks and its fire pans. You shall make all the utensils of bronze. Now you understand why it was so significant for them to bring those utensils back from Nebuchadnezzar. And you shall make a grate for it, a network of bronze. And on the network, you shall make four bronze rings as its, as its four corners. You shall put it under the rim of the altar beneath that the network may be midway up, up the altar. Y'all understand? You just can't put it wherever you want to. And you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. The poles shall be put in the rings, and the poles shall be two sides, on, on the two sides of the altar the bear. You shall make it hollow with boards, as it was shown you on the mountain, so shall they make it. See, here's what they had to do. Not only did they have to find the place to put the altar, somebody had to dig in the word. Y'all, y'all going to miss it. They didn't just haphazardly get together and go, well, you know, the COVID, the, the governor, the mask, the no mask. No, they did it exactly how God said to do it. They prepared to give an offering morning and evening, the correct size, the correct substance. They had to put the bronze in it. They had to put the grate exactly where it was supposed to be. They had to put it right on the base. Are y'all getting anything out of this? I'm going to ask you a question. When was the last time you worshiped God the way God wanted you to worship him? Before you answer that, let me just say this. I hear people say this all the time. Well, I don't like that song. Who cares what you like? I, I don't like this. I don't like, who cares what you like? I don't like this. Who cares what you don't like? Can I get a witness in the house? Then we'll tell everybody, oh, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. No, if somebody gets your chair and it don't start the time you want it to do, they don't do, sing the songs they want you to sing, and it's not the right time, kind of temperature, you get all twisted up. Can I get a witness in the house? See, you have to do it according to God's place, God's purpose, and God's plan. But let me show you the next one. They have to do it according to God's power. But you look at verse number 3. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its basis. I'm going to stop right there for just a second. Do you understand? They went back to desolation, but it was occupied. Do you understand? What I mean by that is there were some other folks living there. The folks that ran them out 70 years earlier. And in the midst of opposition, In the midst of worrying and fear, their number one focus was to get the altar built. I'm just telling you, if it had happened in 2020, our number one focus would make sure that the piano was in tune and let's sing sing it down. And because of the people of those countries, fear had come on them, but guess what they did? They swept it off. They did it according to God's plan. They did it according to God's purpose. And it took the the spirit of God, the power of God, to allow their faith to overcome their fear. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I've said this for four weeks. I'm going to say it again, okay? I've said it longer than that, but for the last four weeks I've said this. The song that faith is, uh, fear is a liar, that's not true. Fear tells the truth. Did you hear me? Fear tells the truth of what you believe. People go, no, no, fear lies to me. No, fear tells the truth. Y'all remember when Y2K came around? You know who the people that was worried the most? It was church folks. That's running around like chicken little, thinking the sky was falling. I'm thinking, dear God, have y'all not read the Bible? Y'all remember? You had to put two drops of Clorox in your water bottles. Don't look at me like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Y'all remember? Get your milk jug, fill it full of water, put your two drops of Clorox in it so it, co- so it, won't, it won't sour on you. Y'all, 9-11 happens, everybody runs around with, like chicken little with their head, thinking their head's going to fall off. The COVID happens, and guess what happens? 
We have both sides of the track telling us if we do this, that we're un, uh, unchristian-like, and if we do this, we're liberal. Can I get a witness in the house? See, it must be the Lord Jesus living his life through you because you're always going to have opposition. There's always people living in that area. And it's amazing to me that people, if they read one book, think they're an expert in that area. Can I get a uh-huh on that? And if you don't want to read the book, just do the Cliff Note version of it. Just watch YouTube because you can find whatever you want to on YouTube. Amen. So you find the constructing of the altar. Point number two is the celebrating of the festivals. See, they didn't just do the altar and go, you know what, that's fine. Because we're, we're not going to get to the building of the temple until about 5 and 6, chapter 5 and 6. Because in chapter 4, the opposition rises again and it holds it up for 14 months. Okay? Um, but they didn't just go, well, God, we got the altar built. Look at what, look at what they did. Look at verses 4 through 6. It says they also... Y'all see the word also? That's important. They also kept the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Because that's the month that you're supposed to keep it in. It's the Festival of Trumpets. It's where we begin these multiple celebrations in the month of September, October. So I want us to kind of just look at a couple of things here. Listen to what it says. They also kept the Feast of Tabernacles, watch this, as it is written, according to Scripture, and offer the daily burnt offerings in the number required by ordinance for each day. Did you get that? I mean, if there would be anybody God would have grace and mercy on would be people that didn't have anything. I mean, the people that had been poor and oppressed. Not according to the Scripture. Are we all right? I mean, I'm telling you, it's a word for today. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offering, and those for new moons... And for all, and for all, and for all, and for all the appointed feasts. They didn't just go halfway in. They didn't just go, well, you know, I'm going to go Sunday morning and only see what's going on. When the church began to come back on Sunday night, they came back Sunday night. When they started back on Wednesday night, they came back on Wednesday night. See, they didn't phase themselves back in. Can I get a witness in the house? They kept every festival, every feast, every burnt offering. On that day, it started to be a process of their life. I want you to see this. Y'all ready? Say, uh-huh. Let me walk you through a couple of things. Number one, they did it according to what was required according to verse 4. Is that not what it says? What is, what is, what's required? Well, let's look at Exodus 29, 38, and 39. Let's look at what it says. Exodus 29, 38, and 39. Now, this is what you shall offer on the altar. Y'all watch this. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. That means every day. Verse 39. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. Every day. I don't know if you're getting it or not. These folks just came out of nothing or came out of something, went to nothing. The only thing they had is what they brought with them. Seven months into this thing, they build an altar, and they do it according to how it's written, and then they begin to celebrate according to how it's written. See, you can't worship how it's written until you sacrifice how it's written. There is no celebration without an altar. So let's walk through it. First of all, you have the Feast of Trumpets. On the first day of what we would call September, but it's not September because it's the middle of the month, but on the first day of this sacred month for the Jews started the Feast of Trumpets. So they would have to sacrifice for the Feast of Trumpets. Then on the 10th day of that month was the Day of Atonement. Are y'all getting this? See, you can't celebrate the, fest, the Feast of Trumpets without an altar. You can't have a Day of Atonement 
without, without an altar. So you can't come and publicly worship until you have some altar time. See, I love when I go to foreign countries because what I find out in foreign countries when we get out of the van or we get out of the car and we start in, there's already been a group of people there about two and a half, three hours praying. And we can't even get Americans to get here on time. True or false? On the first day, the Jews celebrated the Feast of the Trumpets. On the tenth day, they celebrated the Day of Atonement. First day, I said that wrong, Feast of Trumpets. Tenth day, Day of Atonement. Then, on the fifteenth day, five days after the Day of Atonement, from the fifteenth day to the twenty-first day, a whole eight days, they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. Here it is. Afterwards, verse 4, they also kept the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings and the number required by orders for each day. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offerings and those for the new moon. So let me just walk you through what would have happened for eight straight days. Y'all ready? Say amen. Remember, don't tell me you can't afford to give. Don't tell me you can't afford to sacrifice. Don't tell me you can't afford to come. Because if you're going to do it God's way, you've got to do it God's way. In Numbers chapter 29, 13 through 34, you find the requirements for the, this feast and festival of this month. I'm not going to read all of it, okay? But I want to highlight some things. So Numbers 20, uh, 29, go to Numbers 29. It gives us instructions on what and how for the festivals. For the first day, y'all ready? According to verse 13, for the first day, 13 oxen had to be slaughtered. Verse 17, on the second day, 12 oxen had to be slaughtered. Verse 20, had to be 11 slaughtered. Verse 23, 10. Verse 26, Y'all see what's going on? So you start out and you work backwards. So the first one you had to start with 13. The next day you had to bring 12. The next day you had to bring 11. The next day you had to bring 10. You had to bring 9. Then you had to bring 8. I don't know about you guys, but that's a, pretty, that's, that's a lot of oxen. Now look, it's not just one for the nation. It's one for the house. So every household had to bring these numbers. According to what had been set aside, they had to do what was required. Is that not what he says in Ezra? I mean, really, I would guess that most of the folks would say, you know what, God, man, we've had a tough time. We're having a tough time making ends meet. I mean, you didn't stir us up, brought us out here to nothing, took us away from the pots of Babylon, took us out of our comfort, took us away from our families, took us away from our fortune. We had to leave our retirement plan, and now here we are. Can I skip the evening sacrifice? I mean, it's only a lamb. Remember, they started it in the seventh month. All of these sacrifices had to be brought the seventh month. Then it says, not only did he do it according to all of the festivals, but then he says in verse 5, afterwards they offered the regular burnt offering, which meant on a weekly basis, and then he offered those for the new moon. Every month in the life of a Jew, every month there's 12 new moon festivals that the Jews would have to come and offer an offering. Then it says those who were willing offered free will offerings. Which tells me that even the folks that came, including the mixed multitude, some of them really weren't willing to go all the way. Are we all right? I, I share with you guys that the longer you wait, the less you'll come. Because by the time Ezra shows up, they only bring 5,000. See, there's a lot of folks that sit and forget what God's brought them from. Even in the midst of captivity, they don't remember where God's brought them from and where God's taken them to. So the new moons is the festival that they would do every month, not only as individuals but as a nation. The priests would come together and offer the new moon festivals. 
the new moon. Y'all ready for this? The seventh new moon of the religious year, which being in this month, the seventh month, September, October, commenced, it began the civil year. Okay, the spring would be the new year, but the civil year was in September. In other words, if you owed everybody, anybody anything, in the civil year, it was the seventh month that you were looking to to be able to have that erased. In the year of Jubilee, they would start it by the festival of trumpets. And it was a, now you understand why it was a celebration because you didn't have to pay the bank back. Amen? And you got a year free. And so it was the seventh moon of the seventh month, this new moon was significant to the Jews. On that day, they called a holy convocation. They called everybody together. It was a, a, an observance of the day in which was to be regarded in the natural division of time. In other words, yesteryear is gone. This year is new on the new moon. So in conclusion, I've got to ask you this question. As we regather, as we make decisions, as we figure out how we're going to do it, what we're going to do, and how we're going to do it, are you all in? Or, or is just Sunday morning only going to be enough? See, we, we're, we're living in a day right now where I know of six churches in this county that went back to online only. Are you willing to be flexible to come on Saturday night if you have to? Are you willing to come on Sunday afternoon? Do you understand what I'm saying? Are we going to do it according to what God says and get him together and let's quit allowing Sunday to be in, in a race with everything else? Well, Brother Brad, that's when I got to do my grocery shopping. Well, do your grocery shopping on Saturday. Can I get a witness in the house? Amen. Brother Brad, that's when I got to do so-and-so. Do it on Saturday. Well, I got to work on Saturday. Then do it on Friday. Well, I got to work on Friday. Well, join the crowd. Do it at 12 o'clock at night. We make, we make way too many excuses to find why we don't want to do it according to the Word. So here's the question in conclusion. You go ahead and put it up there, sister. In conclusion. Could we join as one man at this place right here? The altar. For the sole purpose of the Lord, not for ours. And can we join as one man at the altar for one purpose, under one power and one lordship, the Lord Jesus? See, first things first. Before we start celebrating there must be consecration. But what we want is just to act like everything's okay. We want to post it on Facebook and tell everybody how much God's blessed us. So here's the question I got to ask you. Are you willing to do it how God says, when God says, and where God says? Are you just going to build your altar however you want to and God just got to take it? We're just going to flip it up and say, okay, God, I've worshiped today. I've done it. Check it off the list. I'm better than the rest of them that didn't come. Or are we going to do it as it's written? Is the most important thing in our lives the place? By way of application, here's the last statements I'm going to make. A.W. Tozer says this, that in American Christianity, the church wants Jesus to be the only one that surrenders and suffers and be crucified. See, when Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. See, there is a believer's cross that must be bore. And what I mean by that is this. You got to do it the way he tells you to do it. Not how you think he tells you to do it. Not how me, mom, people tells you how to do it. Not by what you discuss and find somebody that agree with you. 
but how the book says it. I'm going to ask you a question. Would you just simply do self-evaluation in your own life and just ask God, God, am I doing things out of religious duty how I want to do it instead of how you want to do it? Here's what it says. They did it the way, here it is, that was required. Are you willing to do it how God says to do it, when God says to do it, with what God says to do it, where God says to do it, and do it without complaining? Because in the New Testament, it says, let all things be done without complaining. You remember the grumblers? Last Wednesday night, we talked about the grumblers, the imposters that we talked about last Sunday. So here's the question. Have you ever had a place? Do you have a cross that you can go to on a daily basis, morning and evening, to meet with the Lord? When was the last time you came to this place? Or do we just want to get together and celebrate festivals and not have consecration? You'll never understand the celebration until there's consecration. And you'll never celebrate the way you need to celebrate until God shows you who you're not and who he is. The first thing that they had in the line of importance when it came to the house of God was the altar. What is the most important thing in this place? The Word of God, the Spirit of God come together and a place where we can meet together. Remember and recognize that sin has been atoned for. And then therefore begin to sing and thank God for who He is, what He's done, and what He's going to continue to do. And they just didn't do it once. The Bible says they continually carried it out. Now, God, I don't have all those oxen. God, I don't, I don't have 55 ox that I can kill over the next eight days. You got to do it how it's written. Do you understand? That's what this altar's for. You don't have to carry the burden anymore. There's a light in the darkness. There's a love that's true. Jesus is waiting. He's waiting here for you. Go quickly now before they close the door. That's what this altar is for. There's a lot of folks that I know wishes they had one more chance that they could grab their wife and pray at an altar. There's a lot of folks I know wish they had one more chance to grab their kids and come to the altar. There's a lot of folks that I know wishes they could just get together as a family and come to the altar. Is there anything special about wood? Absolutely not. But I promise you there's a place. A week and a half ago when I was preparing this message, writing it out and getting it in my mind, and figuring out what I needed to do, I can take you to the place. I can take you to the place the day God saved me. I can take you to the place. The carpet's different, but the place is the same. It's got a different color carpet in the place, but I, I can tell you where, I, where it was at. You say, Brother Brad, is it, did, I get, did you get saved? No, I, I, think, I think the Lord saved me before I ever stepped out, but here's what I do know. It became a reality where I was kneeling. Do you have a place? Did you come for God's purpose? Are you going to do it according to God's plan? And regardless of the people that's in the countries and the oppression and the opposition, may the power of God make us one man. Bring us together. Because if we're going to have revival, there must be repentance, there must be regathering, and there must be rebuilding. See, repentance is the tearing down. 
the rebuilding is only what God can do, then there's revival as we regather for one purpose. Would you do whatever God tells you to do it? Do it how he tells you to do it? When he, when he tells you to do it? Where he tells you to do it? You don't have to run up down the aisle, but I am going to say this. There's power in public proclamation. And it very well may be, very well may be, that your family is waiting on you, Dad. It may very well be that your husband's waiting on you, ma'am. You say, Brother Brad, they ought not be waiting on me. Well, that, that's true. But the truth of it is, is God can use you and the lives of others as you just simply be obedient to what he's told you to do, when he's told you to do it, how he's told you to do it, where he's told you to do it. That's obedience. So you can look like you're obeying but still fighting on the inside. So I want to ask you this one question. Are you ready to build an altar? Here I raise my Ebenezer. Are you willing to build an altar and say, no matter what anybody else in my family does, this is where I'm going to meet with the Lord? Maybe today is the day. Maybe today is your seventh month. Maybe today is your day that you've come together unknowingly and God's begun to work on you as you've sat in this room. The Spirit of God, as you've listened to the Word of God, began to just simply chip away things at you. For some of you in this room, you've got to clean it off. You hear me? You've got some garbage. You've got to, you've got to sweep it off. You've got to go through the rubbish. You've got to find the place. And then you've got to set it the way God says it. And then you've got to continue to do what he's called you to do. I wish it was easy, but it's not. I wish I could tell you just come down here and God will fix everything, but that's not how it works. Because every day you've got to bring your ox. Every day you're going to have to continue. If you're going to celebrate, you've got to continue to consecrate. Why, Brother Brad? Because that's what he's commanded us to do. Well, Jesus did it. Yeah, he did. But you've got to deny self. You've got to crucify the flesh. You've got to put off the old man, put on the new man. But you can't do that until you've had a place. So I want to ask you a question. Do you have a place? Do you have a place where God deposited his life into you? I'm not asking, did you say a prayer? I'm not asking, did you give your life to Jesus? What I'm asking you is, do you have a place where Jesus stepped out of heaven and into you? If not, you better begin to speak to the Lord. Let's see what the Lord does. If you do have a place, how long has it been since you dusted it off? How long has it been since you grabbed the hold of the horns of the altar and hung on until God showed up? First things first. Before we can come to Sunday school tonight, we've got to spend some time at the altar. Let's pray.